Good morning. The Nebraska Juvenile Justice Association would like to welcome you to family engagement using mindfulness, positive role modeling, and self-awareness to promote harmony and growth presented by Dr. Luke Bossard. This presentation will be approximately 90 minutes. All participants have been placed on mute. If you have any questions for our presenter, please enter it in the chat. We will be monitoring questions as they come in and we'll get to as many as time permits following the conclusion of the presentation. There will be a short survey that will appear after the webinar concludes. Please take time to answer and provide your feedback. For purpose of CEUs, if you are viewing this webinar in a room with others, please make sure to type your name and email address into the chat so that you will receive your certificate. Certificates will be mailed, emailed to participants this week. Dr. Bossard has a diverse treatment background working in multiple residential treatment settings, inpatient treatment and community mental health. He is currently an independent clinical psychologist who works collaboratively with a group of 10 other psychologists in Lincoln, Nebraska. He also provides clinical supervision to therapists at Family Service of Lincoln. In his outpatient practice, Dr. Bassard primarily treats children and adolescents with anxiety disturbance impacting adaptive functioning. He is a father of four children ages four to 14 and has a strong desire to support family harmony. I will now turn it over to Dr. Bassard. Okay, thank you, Christy. Welcome everybody. Um, hope you had your coffee um, by now and your bathroom break and everything because we're gonna start rolling here and it's gonna be kind of fast paced, but because I have a lot of material I want to share. This is a very important topic, I think, right now. Um, and I came upon some really great information that I thought I wanted to share. I can't take credit for a lot of this. I, I'm going to be sharing information that I've garnered from um, a couple of different sources. <clears throat> and so um, there's going to be a couple of activities that we'll do to keep you activated, uh, mixed in here, um, where there'll be a little bit of an interaction. Um, but so let's just talk about this topic. Uh, first of all, I guess she already went over the who I am, but what is more important to me is who you are. Uh, my assumptions are that you are an instrument of care to families uh, in different, I know, understand this went out, this invitation went out to a lot of different agencies. I know some with juvenile justice, but there were others in the community who are, have been invited to this. Invited to this. So um I believe that um, you all are instruments of care to families in one way or another. Um, you give of yourself to enhance others, the, the benefit of others. I understand also probably that you're mother or father, aunt, uncle, brother, sister. So obviously we all have connections to community, to family. And uh, so this uh, training is going to have everything to do with community and connection. And so I hope to offer you some ideas on how to engage um, both professionally and also within your own families. Um, so, <clears throat> so one of my objectives here is to support harmony in the family. And I have this picture of a guy that's laughing hysterically because this is hard to do in the families, especially that we serve. Some of the families we serve are really struggling. Um, many of them have um, serious problems happening as far as loss or trauma or uh, conflict. Um, and so for those of us who work with families to try to engage them in a way that's going to promote harmony is a very challenging task. I hope to help you with that today. Um, but it is, I understand the challenges that come with that. Um, but the other thing is growth in the family. You know, harmony is one thing, but growth is really just this idea of how can we help them move forward um, in a more successful way. And again, I have some ideas. I hope that will help you. But the thing, um, oh, so um, like I said, the, the source that I'm going to be using a lot today is this book, Habits of the Household, written by Justin Early. Um, this book uh, really provided some amazing ideas that were in one, on one hand simple, but on the other hand, we just don't do these things as families right now, in my opinion, in our culture that we have. And the families who we work with are probably definitely not doing the things that we're going to talk about today. In some ways, it's almost like we need to kind of go back in time and revisit the ideas of 
how we engage sort of while understanding there's this digital world, we have to figure out a way as families to find each other. And um, this book really does try to kind of help us find our way in doing that. The thing is, there is a pink elephant or an elephant in the room. And um, the elephant in the room has been COVID and the impact COVID had on families. Um, we have to talk about that because it didn't just impact families in heavy ways, it impacted us as providers of care in heavy ways as well. Um, a little word association game here. Maybe the, some of these words are familiar to you. Burnout, chronic fatigue, vicarious trauma, that's sort of carrying the trauma of the people who we work with, with us home. Um, compassion fatigue, we heard a lot of that as therapists. Um, compassion fatigue was coined in 95. It's called, it's, he's talking about the cost of caring. Um, and so I think a lot of us in different professions in different areas have talked about the cost of caring, but have we really talked about how it relates to our own mental health? Um, I think it's important that we are realistic about the impact this has had on us. Now, I understand we're a little bit moving, we're moving forward from COVID, but obviously as far as the economy goes and um, some of the after effects, we're still dealing with it. And especially families who are um, maybe uh, lower income types of families who may be struggling, continuing to struggle and maybe even struggling now worse than they were before. Um, we have to kind of understand we need to be taking care of ourselves in our care for them. Now, how do we do that? Well, I was talking to a nurse friend of mine, a lead charge nurse at Bryan. And uh, while I had COVID <laughs> a while back, uh, she it was in the midst of when COVID was pretty heavy in our community. I was I did a little interview with her because it I wanted to hear from someone kind of in the battle, in the trenches about her experience with it. And so I asked her some questions, specific questions, because I wanted to hear how she was not just caring for the patients, but how she was caring for herself. And it was really interesting what I heard. Um, so I asked her, what have you observed related to the morale of your teens of the pandemic as it fluctuated with the waves? And then she said, at the beginning, everyone was saying, this is why we became nurses. About six months in, I noticed the team started running on empty. It's like we were dealing with mass fatigue. Between the waves, morale improved. And then this is when things were pretty heavy, but now people are walking around like zombies. We don't have enough nurses. We're short-staffed. We deal with the daily stress of working with COVID patients. So obviously, what's important here in, this, in her answer to this question was, we all kind of chose the profession that we're in. Uh, most of us really have care and compassion kind of as some of the core personality types. So we, we care for others. We love others. And so we want to serve others. That's kind of at our core. However, it can take its toll. And um, even if it's something we chose and why we became nurses and psychologists and counselors and um, care providers, um, it still takes its toll on us. Um, this work. And then I asked her how she has personally been affected by the job, of not just caring for sick patients, but also leading her team. It's stressful, but I try to be positive for everyone else. Now, again, I know this young lady very well. She happens to be family and I know why she answered that way. She really is just a very caring and sweet person. The thing is, I hope that those of you who work in this field to understand that the concern that I had when I heard this from her, um, because at some point we only have so much in our reserves that we can offer. And this is, uh, this is where we have to set our boundaries and, and take care of ourselves. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. I asked her, what are some of the ways she coped? I remind myself why I went into nursing. I'm a natural caretaker. I'm responsible for taking care of all my patients and all of my staff. And notice again, who she left out here. <laughs> um, and again, I think that that is something that we do 
And so when we talk about families and care for families and uh, our efforts to um, teach harmony and growth, hopefully you're going to see here a parallel between how we care for them and how we care for ourselves. I really feel like it's important, not just with the COVID pandemic, but in our day-to-day -day life as providers of care, we have to take care of ourselves or else we are going to crash and burn. And many of you maybe have hit that kind of over overwhelmed kind of moment already um, and had to kind of learn through that. Um, and those of you who haven't, who maybe just barely dipped along that, um, I think that uh, you understand what I'm talking about here. Um, so if you can relate, my question is, and I, you can put some of these in the chat, <clears throat> what have been or are your three greatest stressors as an instrument of care since COVID hit? Um, maybe, maybe then and maybe even now, I just want you to consider what are the three greatest stressors as an instrument of care that you deal with? Think about it, write it down. Um, and then if maybe I'll just take a peek at the chat and see what some of the things that you all are saying here on the stressors that you you encounter. So feeling like we're not able to help some of the people's needs that they have, the changing guidelines, not knowing what's going to happen, finances, keeping loved ones safe who is going through cancer treatment, paperwork, fatigue, hypervigilance, I'm assuming maybe from a health perspective, um, getting appointments completed with limitations, space, time, uncertainty about the future, too much screen time, people are zoomed out, having to work from home without resources available, students not being able to adjust to classroom settings since they've been behind the screen for so long. Okay, more intense services. All right, thank you. So, um, we are not out of the woods here, people. <laughs> and this is very, very challenging times. Um, and so our families are definitely in distress, are definitely fatigued, and so are we. But some of us are doing better than others. But, um, and you mentioned it, but I was also asking, how have you seen the impact of COVID on the families with whom you work? We're not going to go into this too much in detail, but um, think about that um, and how this imp has impacted them and continues to impact them. Um, it is a lot on their plate, and frankly, it is a lot on our plate. Um, so something either is going to give or we have to do things differently um, as individually and as agencies. Um, we have to be tuned into a different way. Um, I work with an agency that we just had to sort of reassess what the needs were and in a sense sort of just like shift into a completely different gear in terms of how we were supporting our team um, and really listening to the team and like taking more some of the pressure off of them. And it just was really, really important that we, we listened and did things differently. So in order to do things differently, or if we do things differently, I think we have an opportunity to build resiliency. And I want to talk about what that means, building resiliency. And also, though, as families and even within our agencies, make meaning making the habit. I feel like in some ways, if we don't do that, the habit becomes survival. Meaning making is sort of the opposite of survival. Um, it's when we are taking opportunities to see like, how am I growing from this? How am I affecting others? How am I being affected in positive ways? 
um, so that we're not just basically trying to keep our heads above water um, as it as the water rises. So here's what I want to do. We're going to get into resiliency in a minute, but talking about stress has probably risen, you know, your stress level maybe has risen a little bit, but um, so we're going to come to, uh, we're going to take care of ourselves in just a minute, but when it comes to resiliency, I learned about this woman, Christina Cook. She was in space when COVID hit. And it's kind of funny because, you know, they're in space completely separate from what we were all dealing with. Um, she was up there for 11 months, the longest space flight of any woman at the time. I don't know if someone has broken that record yet, but um, so she returns to earth as COVID is happening and she was interviewed. And I thought her answers were very useful to us and to me. So, so she was asked what lessons she learned when she was in space. And she said, the biggest one that I think about is humility. Now, listen to what she says here, especially, again, as we talk about community in our communities, as in agencies and the people we work with, recognizing it's okay to ask for help, to rely on the people around you, being humbled to be part of something so great, to be working with a team of people so good at what they do that can overcome amazing engineering and scientific feats. So humility and in incorporating that into my day-to-day -day has been a big takeaway of the mission. Now, this woman's amazing. She went to outer space. She was probably hand-selected. She's probably a genius. And yet she approaches her work and her, her life, especially her professional life, with humility, as in, I'm willing to ask for help. I'm relying on the people around me. I'm leaning into them and not assuming that just because she was selected and is incredibly bright and capable, um, she's not assuming she can do it herself. Um, I thought that was really, really helpful. Those of us who are probably, I'm guessing a lot of you are type A, a lot of you are self-starters and very you know, high achievers. Um, so it's kind of tempting to just lean into our own abilities, but I don't know if you all hit the wall because I'm, I described myself kind of there and I hit a couple walls along the way here. I couldn't do it on my own. Um, I had to be more humble and accept help and ask for help um, at different top points here. Um, but the other thing she said is the human space flight program does a great job of building in resiliency by making sure we actually build in margin for everything we do. Even though that might mean we take a hit on efficiency, we recognize we always have to be ready for the unexpected. We don't know when the emergency is going to come. So we need an excess of power from our solar arrays. We need an excess of energy from our crew members. We need an excess of time in our ops tempo to accommodate that. She's talking space lingo, I think. But apply what she's saying to you and your agency. She's talking about we need an excess. And I know that sounds like we don't have that in our agency. Sorry. But this is really important in agencies. We have to step back and go, where can we find excess? teaching us there's a balance between efficiency and resiliency. Um, so building that in, in different ways. Now I found a way to do that and I'm a busy guy, but building in resiliency, as in I changed my schedule, I still see plenty of clients, but I adjusted a few things so that I could take care of myself more. I could receive help more. I could connect with my um, team more. Um, I was able to set some boundaries more. Um, and then even though it feels like maybe I'm giving up a little on the efficiency or on the productivity, actually, if we build resiliency in, what you might find is it might seem like there's less productivity, but actually there's more. You know, it's, it's kind of interesting that what you might see if you adjust a few things, you might feel like, uh oh, I'm giving away stuff here. But when you have more energy and more focus, and when you're not just keeping your head above water, it does make us more effective. And if we're more effective, then I think we can be um, just as productive or possibly even more productive. Um, so, so now, take a moment to compare 
how astronaut Cook talked about dealing with adversity versus the charge nurse when talking about dealing with adversity. Who is more likely to experience burnout? Rhetorical question. I think you know the answer. And think about why. Remember what she was saying. Great heart. She loves her patients. She loves her team. But she was not operating in a way that was going to allow her to be resilient and to have excess um, uh, resiliency in there. Who will likely persist in the face of distress and why? So this is important. And I want you to think about the application here. Um, Now, so how can we integrate care, self-care in? I learned a concept called lived self-care in a training I did a while back defined as self-initiated ongoing practice, taking an active role in protecting well-being and happiness. So now I sent, I had Christy send out the sheet to you. You should have this slide because it's a lot of information. It's way too much information to like take notes or try to remember. But, um, But I want you to take a look at that when you get a chance, you know, and print it off and have that available to yourself because we as givers of care need to do these kinds of things with boundaries, um, healthy escapes, um, value your needs generously, create a flourishing environment, resonate with your mission, um, play at work and outside of work. My dad is a very accomplished man. Um, He would tell you probably the thing that has helped him to be um, resilient in the face of all the stressors he dealt with was fishing. Fishing was his kind of outlet. And uh, for many of you, you have different kinds of activities that you enjoy that can be your sort of play outside of work. Um, now, we also I also have these, which of course can apply to you as well, but um, what we need to talk about with our families and specifically parents, uh, minding their body, nurturing the relationships, cultivate spirituality, um, fostering optimism, um, finding resilient role models in their life and asking them like my dad, um, how do they do it? You know, again, garnering some information from others. That's that humility again, um, enhancing cognitive, emotional flexibility. Okay. So the other thing I talk about, uh, by the way, so you have, should have that sheet if you don't talk to Christy, <laughs> but um, so when I work with my clients, um, I pull out this sheet and, um, like over the years, it's very simple, but over the years, I've just been monitoring kind of what I've noticed are some of sort of foundational aspects of well-being, And I call them the six pillars of emotion of mental health. Um, so the first three on the top, eat well, sleep well, exercise. Now, yeah, that seems obvious. Those three, however, how many of our clients are not getting exercise right now? Really appropriate exercise. So when I say exercise, what I mean is three to four days a week, moderate to vigorous exercise. Okay, my clients don't have time for that. I doubt it. I bet they have time. They might have to sacrifice somewhere, but we have to be exercising. We are made and built to move. Movement, by the way, I just went to a training on trauma with one of the top experts in the world who wrote the book, um, The Body Keeps the Score. His first name's Bessel. I can't pronounce his last name, but um, he talked about body, body care and movement as very, very important um, to our uh, working through trauma. So things like yoga. Um, and exercise and activity are critical. So we need to be exercising. We need to be really promoting exercise, sleeping well. Again, sleep is a problem in our world right now in America. Uh, Again, there's a lot of distractions that keep us up. Um, There's this black hole of different videos that the phone learns about us that kind of takes us takes us there and an hour can turn into two hours and our 
Our kids and our homes have access to electronics. And so without adequate sleep, sleep deprivation is extremely bad for our kids. Obviously, it affects their mood. They can be more agitated. It affects their focus. Um, I get some people coming in thinking they have ADHD, but then I ask about their sleep schedule and it's terrible. And I say, I'm not going down this road with ADHD or ADD with you until you get your sleep schedule under control, because that is probably seriously affecting your ability to focus. So we have to be sleeping. We have to be exercising. Um, by the way, I usually use the Mayo Clinic website. Um, it has really great advice on like what it eight-year-old should be getting as far as sleep, what an adult should be getting, what a teenager should be getting. Um, you know, it's, you know, it's a bit different depending and everybody's brains are a little different on that, but I just think there's a, an epidemic it's, it's sleep is a problem. So also diet is really critical here. I don't, um, I can't really speak too much on, on diet necessarily, but you know, there's plenty of research out there about how diet is beneficial. So Eat well, sleep well, exercise. Mastery and pleasure activity. I was talking about fishing earlier. Um, research tells us that one of the best antidepressants out there is doing things that give you a sense of accomplishment regularly. So um, what that might be for a teenager learning an instrument or even an adult. Um, engaging in activities that give them a sense of enjoyment. Um, regularly. Um, so I have kids telling me, well, that's video games for me. Well, I would prefer that we do activities where there's more of a sense of accomplishment, where there's some kind of tangible evidence of growth. Um, it could be art, you know, creative outlets. Um, it could be building things. My wife is really good at woodworking and she's building our cabinets in our house right now and with these beautiful wood and um, I can see it's really benefiting her to do that um, so eat well sleep well exercise mastery activities mindfulness and spirituality um, I um, not everybody has a spiritual life um, and uh, but what we're talking about here is getting settled we're going to do a little bit of a mindfulness activity in a bit, but we need to find the present and get focused in the here and now, especially when we go into stressful or challenging situations and not, we face those as care providers every single day. So I hope that the majority of you have your method for getting grounded, getting settled into the here and now before you try to engage with people who are dealing with really, really hard things in life. For us to be present and really tuned in and in a good place, we need to have our practice of some type of mindfulness or spirituality that we can lean into in preparation to move into that type of um, interaction. And then, of course, positive relationships. Um, we are built for a relationship. I believe that. And so, again, I think the digital world and electronics have, and COVID, brought us into our homes and isolate, isolated. I had this rash of teenagers right after COVID happened, coming to my office, telling me they had social anxiety disorder, telling me they had social anxiety disorder. And I found out they learned this from TikTok. TikTok was their um, psychologist, I guess, or a medical provider or psychiatrist who told them they had social anxiety disorder. And when I listened to what they were saying, really saying what they were saying was they didn't really know how to talk and have conversations anymore. And so I told them, I don't think you have social anxiety disorder. I think you're rusty. Let's relearn how to have conversations. <laughs> and so we did that. We practiced conversations. So relationships are really critical. We can, encourage that in our clients. But these are the six pillars of mental health. I believe in this. This is foundational. Now I have someone mowing outside of my office. I hope you can still hear me. Um, so now time for self-care. Let's take a minute. We talked about mindfulness. I would like mindfulness to be your habit. 
By the way, there are some great mindfulness apps out there um, that you can use or that you can tell your clients to use. Um, I use one called Insight Timer. Um, so Insight Timer is one. Um, there's an app called Calm, which I know LeBron James promotes. And he's on there, which may be cool for some of your adolescents, especially male clients. Um, there's many others too. You can look them up. Um, but anyway, so um, I have an autistic client who was just agitated in the mornings. So I, and he's, you know, one of these very rigid black and white thinkers. So I said to him, I want mindfulness to be your new habit. And I talked to him about this uh, app. I think he's on day 180 of doing mindfulness in the morning uh, in his streak. And his parents, like two weeks in, they came back and like, what did you tell him to do? Because he didn't even tell him he was doing it. And his his agitation level decreased significantly. And so he had been kind of coming at his mother when he was upset and kind of grabbing her and that ended. And he was just more calm. Um, and so mindfulness can have that kind of effect um, on our clients and on ourselves. So one of my preferred grounding techniques to use with my clients is one called body scan. Many of you may be familiar with body scan. Um, but it's one that can be performed, um, lying down, sitting, um, and other postures. Uh, but what it does is it encourages you and the client to find the center point middle way through the chaos. We're going to talk about chaos and order in different ways. But, um, so I want to try this with you, um, wherever you are, I'd like us to do a brief mindfulness exercise. This will be very brief, but I want you to really engage. I know what you're thinking. I don't, I didn't come here for this, but try this with me. I want you to practice this because um, maybe body scan is the activity that will be helpful to you. And again, many of my clients really like this one. So, so I would prefer if right now we're sitting down. Um, now, if you're sitting, I want you to just have kind of an upright posture. It's called the mountain pose. Basically, the top of your head is the peak, and then it comes down. And so we're going to sit in this sort of upright posture. Mindfulness is not kind of, you know, uh, total relaxation. It's more of a tuned in, getting present type of activity. So so I'll do this meditation. And I want you to, as we begin this, to bring attention to your body. It might be helpful for you to close your eyes. Your feet should be on the, on the ground in front of you. Kind of notice this as you sink into the couch or the chair or wherever you're sitting right now. And just start by taking a slow, deep breath. So I want you to start at your forehead and the small muscles around your eyes. And I want you to make room for any ache or tightness that may be there. I even have my younger clients kind of bring a color to the forehead, kind of this calm color and to the eyes. Explore softening the forehead, softening around your eyes. And focus your energy there. Now notice the muscles of your cheeks and jaw. Sometimes I drop my mouth and kind of do the back and forth a little bit. Those of us who grind our teeth at night, your jaws, you might notice some tension there. Imagine letting go of that, bringing soft awareness there. Now sweep your attention down the back of the neck into the shoulders. How are the shoulders doing? Make room there, softening, allowing the shoulders to fall away from the ears. Now 
you might notice on your dominant hand side, that side of your shoulder might be a little more tense. Bring a soft awareness there. Bring that light there if you chose a light earlier. Focus your attention on the space between the shoulder blades. Imagine what it would be like to breathe in and out between your shoulders, almost like there's a vent there. Bring it all the way through. And when you breathe out, breathe out any toxins, bring out, breathe out any negative energy. Notice your upper chest. Notice the rise and fall of your chest while you breathe. Now sweep the attention all the way down the spine, but one vertebrae at a time. Gradually release the tension all the way down slowly till it settles on the lower back. I almost imagine a stretch, a stretching, and a release. Notice the sensations in the lower back. What would it be like to imagine breath moving down and into and out of your lower back? Any of you carry tension there? Now let's bring gentle awareness to the stomach, to the belly. Experiment with how much you might be able to soften the belly. Notice a soft rise and fall there as you breathe in and out. Now allow the attention to settle on your hips. Explore how much your hips can let go, even as you're seated here. Let yourself sink in. Now I want you to try to imagine your attention at the top of one of your leg. Let's start with your left leg. Focus there for a minute. Let your awareness flow down that leg down your thigh, past the knee, down the shin and calves. Notice you might notice almost a tingling down in the feet and down into the floor or out your toes. Push that energy down. You feel a tingle, it's good. Pushing it out all the way out. Now let's bring attention back to the top of the right leg. Let your awareness flow down that leg, down the thigh, past the knee, down the shins and calves. Bring that tingling, bring that energy down, down the feet and out the toe. Now sit in a focused way and what would it be like to be aware of your body all at once? See if you can experience your body as a single system. You might detect tension somewhere still in your body. And if you do, bring some soft awareness there to the best of your ability. Maybe it's in your stomach. And see if you can bring some softness there. Maybe it's that right shoulder. Maybe it's the jaw. Try to just embrace the body is a single system now. And to end this practice, it might be helpful to draw on a breath. Move your fingers and toes. Maybe a little stretch up as this meditation ends. Now, give yourself just a moment of rest as we get started again with our, with our training now. But I want you to notice how you're feeling in this moment. I want you to notice 
if you're in your room, in this place, in your office, and that you feel very connected with this here and now moment. So critical to do that, especially if there's trauma, if there's tension and energy that you've from yesterday, from a client a week ago. This moment, though, you are centered in this here and now, and this is a very, very good place to be. And hopefully you can feel that. But we need to move on. I wanted you to experience body scan, though. That was just one example of body scan. There's lots of different types of it. But so let's get back to the training now. Um, and making meaning, making the habit. We're going to really focus now on getting into our families. And the rest of this time is all going to be about family, families that we work with. Remember when it mentioned chaos a little bit ago? Well, the opposite of chaos is order. Um, and in order to have order, those of you who work in juvenile justice understand you have to have rules. And those rules need to be understood and applied in the systems, whether it be a work system, whether it be a home system. We have to have our communal habits. We have to have our rules. Um, so I found this funny barn rules somewhere and I like these there's here's the barn rules uh you know if you don't know ask if you borrow it turn it if you smoke don't if you break it fix it if it drinks water give it some okay these are barn rules maybe these don't apply to our families but at least this barn has some rules they're kind of trying to maintain their order there all right now think about your household rituals first, then we'll get into our families, but think about yours. Okay. How did your family start the day? How, how did your family start the day this morning? Think about that for a minute. What are your family meal times like? How does your family play together? We don't ask ourselves these questions very often, and maybe there are some of you who feel like you do great in all three of these areas. And if you do, thumbs up to you. But I'm guessing many of you are looking at these going, Ooh, we could do these better. We could do one of these better. We could do all three. And I pretty much can guarantee you families who come to us for care are not doing well in one or more or probably all three of these areas. Okay, so we need to talk about this. Remember I talked about going back in time. We need to revisit what, how we're doing this um, not only as rituals, but as, again, meaning-making opportunities. Habits of the household develop meaningful routines and memorable moments. That is the premise here. And that is where we have the opportunity to find harmony, where we have the opportunity to find growth. Now, um, we as care providers <clears throat> are role modeling all the time. We as parents are role modeling all the time. You all know this. It's not as much about what parents teach and say, but what they do or allow. And uh, Tammy sort of suggested we talk about this as one aspect of how we're doing this. But, you know, with our families, you know, if they let Johnny, you know, fifth grade Johnny stay home because he's nervous about something, Johnny's brain now feels really good because it's Johnny was able to avoid that uncomfortable thing, that stressful thing that day. And parent feels like, oh, Johnny's happy. Johnny feels good. Now, though, Johnny's brain just realized something. When I avoid, I feel great. Johnny probably will be asking to stay home again, and it won't be long. This is where the beginning of excessive truancies begins. It begins way back when Johnny is allowed that opportunity, or if Johnny um, is allowed other opportunities. As parents, when those yeses become excessive and we allow them to get away with things, that's when we lose that aspect of control and that's when chaos arrives. And my, you might be thinking, it's not chaotic when a kid is at peace at home. Well, again, we're all care providers. I think we're all speaking the same language here. 
the chaos is coming because we haven't maintained order in that in that decision. And we have to catch them early or else this can happen. And those of us who work with teenagers know about school avoidance. Um, just it's one example of how when we allow things to happen, chaos can ensue. Um, and there is a cost to this. We all know this. Allowing families to follow cultural habits leads our children into a problematic direction. Okay, what are the results? Excessive, you know, and I'm going to go into some of the problems. Excessive screen time, busyness, withdrawal, loneliness, unmitigated addictions, chronic need for stimulation. You know, I talk about this sometimes with students who tell me school is so boring. Well, by comparison to the video games, it's true. And, you know, and I feel for teachers, it's very hard to, I think, to, for them to, uh, to stimulate these students' brains in ways that these games do. Um, but we've kind of created this problem when we've allowed our children to engage in uh, media sources excessively. Now they have this need for stimulation. And there are problems. Our kids aren't communicating as well anymore. Depression is up. Anxiety is up. Suicide, especially in rural areas, is up. Drug and alcohol use is up. I mean, I am shocked at some of the younger and younger clients that I have who are vaping, who are dabbling in alcohol and other things. Um, and those of you who work with clients who um, are engaged with drugs and alcohol, you see it too. It's, it's more, it's younger, it's scary. Um, Gaming, social media addictions. And I know that parents sometimes throw around this gaming addiction thing, maybe maybe more than they should, but um, but it's pretty clear that our kids are wired to seek that type of stimulation. Obesity is, this one kind of surprised me, 20% of 20, 12 and 19 year olds are clinically obese in America. Um, kids are having more academic problems. So we have to respond and we have to have some methods that will help us and help you. Um, I am going to, now this is get, again, pulling from this book. There are more than six in this book. Okay. But I'm going to point out six that I thought we could really focus on. And again, you should have received um, a handout with these six. <clears throat> if you didn't, then you can talk to Christy, but um, and I have these on there. Um, and if you want to try to jot some things down, I'll add to them. But the six habits are how we wake up, meal times, screen times, play, conversation, and bedtime. Now, we're going to talk about how we can create new habits in households with these six, in these six areas. Um, okay. So I'm using the word assess here because. What we can do with our clients when we're talking to parents specifically is to ask them, what do mornings look like at your house? You can ask yourself that. Now, then we have to talk, and this is again with the parents. Are they waking up to monsters? This is an early word. And we're not talking about their kid. They are not the monsters that we're talking about here. The monsters of the morning, there are three monsters of the morning. The first is scanning work emails. That is the monster of performance. If you're scanning work emails right away, then you are connecting to your type A performance side right out of the gate before you're engaging with your kids. And early would say that is not preparing you and it's not preparing other parents for that opportunity that they have to commune with their kids first thing in the morning. Another morning, monster of the morning, social media. You would call that the monster of comparison. You know, when you're on different kinds of Facebook or these different things, you're looking at other people's worlds and going, geez, I wish I was in Greece right now. You know, wow, they seem really happy. <laughs> um, this monster of comparison takes its toll on us as parents. Then there's the monster of fear and anger, news sources. Um, you know, 
the news the last few years has become fear-mongering. It doesn't matter what side you're on. There's a lot of fear out there when we watch the news. And starting your day there isn't beneficial. And, start, and our parents starting the day there isn't beneficial. So you can ask them about these monsters of the morning and ask your parents, are, are any of these happening? Um, if their parents are waking up to the alarm, grabbing the phone immediately and scrolling the news and social media, I would suggest to them, change that habit. We had a, need a new habit in the morning. Instead, talks, we talk about this creating a ritual of gather and send. Now, I know maybe some of you professionals are up and out of the house even before, you know, your kids are up. But, um, but for those of us who are have the opportunity to gather and send in the morning, that would be the ritual that we want to create here. Okay, so here's some ideas. Again, keep the phone out of sight, notifications off in the morning. We need that out of the way. That will be a distraction from this gather and send idea. Can we playfully bring the child to the place of communion? I go and give my daughter Mila a piggyback ride to the breakfast table. Um, and I usually try to tickle my daughter Maho, which kind of annoys her, but it's playful and she kind of knows it's coming. It's how we do that. Um, joining together. There might be a little time for cuddling on the couch, eating some breakfast, packing lunch. My family likes listening to some music in the morning. Some families say a prayer together. You know, we have, we live out in the country. So I walk with my children up to the bus stop. We, I bring a ball. Usually we throw a ball together. All of my children, we're throwing, tossing the ball around. There's just this communing time. My phone is still up in my room at that point. Um, and so there's opportunities for us to join with our children and for our parents that we're working with to join with their children. Chaos can happen. I know that. And however, um, I think if we get good adequate rest, we can get up in time to engage in these kinds of ways. All right. Ask them what are mealtimes like? Family therapist Anna Fischel says only about 30% of families regularly eat dinner together. In affluent families, the numbers have gone up. In low-income families, they've gone down, which speaks to the extra stressors of having to work extra jobs, having unpredictable schedules, not having as much access to healthy food. So why does mealtime matter? 80% of teenagers say that family dinner is the time of the day they're most likely to talk to their parents. Didn't know that. But you didn't know that. That's interesting, isn't it? Regular family dinners are associated with lower rates of depression, anxiety, substance abuse. I really should have this cited. I need to add that to the next slide or the next time I provide this. But um, substance abuse, eating disorders, high rates of re uh, resiliency. Kids who grow up having family dinners tend to have, eat more healthy and to have lower rates of obesity later in life. This all was pulled from a site that I'm going to give you in just a minute here. Um, but um, what's at the center of mealtimes? Communing, not consuming. I like that. We're supposed to use mealtimes as opportunities to talk. Um, food is great, a great sort of mediator where we can just eat and talk and connect and commune. It's not about eating together as much as it's about connection and engaging in the quality time together. Okay, so ideas for mealtime. Get the children or the teenager to engage in meal prep, set the table, um, make the food, um, especially our teenagers. It's a great opportunity to tell, tell the parents who have a 16-year-old, hey, your 16-year-old is going to need to know how to make food. Have them help you. Um, make a rule, no electronic devices at the dinner table. Um, then there's like these semi-structured communication activities, one called pass the pepper. Basically, you've got your pepper. A shaker, whoever's holding the pepper, basically it kind of functions as a microphone. They've got the floor, they can talk and you pass it to the person. Someone raises their hand, you pass it them. So whoever's holding the pepper gets to talk. Uh, I like to do with my family best and worst of the day um, where my kids get to say something that went well and then something that was terrible. Um, and uh, we just, it's kind of a similar idea to pass the pepper, um, but you know, it's a way to kind of engage at the dinner table. 
Um, it's relationship building can happen even in its raw, unborn, sometimes chaotic form. Not too long ago, my seven-year-old was acting up. She had to leave the table for a little bit uh, and a little bit of a timeout. It was mealtime was not enjoyable for our family that day, um, but we got her back and we tried again. It is not pretty at times, but meal times are an opportunity to commune. There's lots of evidence out there to suggest we should not miss on this opportunity and to talk about our families about the benefits of eating together. This is the website that I pulled some of those um, data from, the familydinnerproject.org. Um, the, the woman who runs that site has a lot of great ideas um, and you can check that out if you'd like. Um, good stuff there. Um, okay. Ask our families, what are the screen time habits at your house? You probably already asked this question because this is a big deal. Um, now, again, back to habits of the household book, Justin Early would say it's a fight for formation. What does he mean? Well, our kids are being shaped one way or another. There is no neutral. So our kids are either being shaped by what they're seeing online, like the kids coming in telling me they had social anxiety disorder. The parents didn't tell that them that. TikTok did. did. And TikTok's telling them a whole lot of other things. And so is Instagram. And so is all these other sites that they're on right now. Um, so they're being shaped one way or another. So our families need to understand that we need to decide what exposure they're going to have and how we're going to interrupt that exposure. I'm going to talk about that here in a second because you're probably saying, I don't know how to do this. We've been trying to get electronics away from families for, for years. I understand that. Don't worry. We'll talk about this in a minute. But, um, but what I'm really talking about here is kind of morals and values. Um, I asked teenagers early on in my work with them what their morals and values are. They usually have no idea what I'm talking about or they're pretending to not know. So then I just, I pursue it a little more and I say, what do you use as your direction in terms of how you um, make decisions socially, especially? How do you make your decisions socially? And I cannot tell you how many times I have heard the answer, YOLO. You only live once. And that scares me. If that's what our teenagers are basing their decisions on, that's scary because one bad decision can turn into a car crash killing multiple kids or, um, you know, starting a, an addiction. Um, so we are really in a fight for our kids' future in terms of their decision making and their morals and values and how they're making their decisions going forward. Um, parenting's hard. But it has the parent formed a screen time rut in their child as a result of the desire for peace and quiet. I know how helpful it can be sometimes for exhausted parents to use TV and other electronic media as a sort of nanny. Um, I'm guilty of that at times. Um, but when we form a screen time rut, those kids are immediately, their brains are immediately seeking that stimulation. Um, and when that child is immediately seeking that stimulation, that's a sign we've got a problem. We create that high stimulation activity seeking in our children. All right, here are some ideas. Now, I know this is an obvious one, and many of you have tried to do this with families you work with, determining a limit um, and following through. There are different kinds of apps and different things parents can use to shut down or monitor and know kind of when two hours or one hour or whatever is up and it shuts it down. Um, but there has to be a follow through here. Um, if there is a, is a family rule that's been established, the follow through has to happen. I have mo mothers coming to me saying, but if I turn off his phone, he'll get mad at me. Yes, he might, but especially at first, but we have to sort of, 
Um, I remember at one residential treatment facility I worked at, we had kind of these steps. One of them was called forming, where we say to our kids, okay, here's the rules now, when they joined us at the residential facility. And they say, oh, yeah, it's easy. We can do that. Okay. They, so it looks like they're doing great. Boy, this is easy. These kids, they get it. Then the next phase is storming. Storming happens when kids go, I don't like these rules. These rules suck and screw you. Okay. That's the storming phase. Moms and dads need to understand storming is part of the process. I know it's scary. Some of the kids we work with are scary and they will push it as far as they possibly can to make our parents bail on the rule. Now, the bad, so that's the bad news for parents dealing with the storm now, but so we're forming storming. Once the storming happens and we hold on tight and I mean tight and we seek support and we do our best to manage and hold on. Then we get to a place of norming where the brain of the child, teenager or whatever goes, crap, this is the system I'm in. And if I do things the wrong way, things aren't very pleasant for me. If I do thing, if I abide by the system that I don't like, if I abide by the rules I don't like, I get some of the things I do like. And there's a better chance for me tomorrow to get the things that I want. So it's probably better for me to norm into this kind of rule system. And the last phase that we talked about at our residential facility was forming, I mean, uh, performing. So norming, or forming, storming, norming, performing was when we had these kids who had been at our facility for you know, nine months now, they've gone through these phases. They realize, okay, they're kind of ready to start the process of reintegrating back into their homes. And they realize, don't buck this system. It's no fun if you try that. And they are sort of teaching now the other, the other new residents coming in, hey, you know, you just might want to stop fighting the authority at this point. It's not working for you. It's not going to work here. Um, obviously, at a residential facility, you got a lot of staff or well-trained. I know our parents that we work with are not well-trained, but that's our job. We can train them the best we can. We need them to understand there's going to be a storming phase. Um, but here's something. I don't see people doing this very much. You know, if you're going to ask your kids, you know, if we're going to tell parents to limit, we need to replace that time with something else. And again, the kids are going to think these things are lame at first, but maybe you do a family movie night together. Maybe we do, we go to the YMCA a little bit more. Maybe we do, you know, I do a dog trip, dog park trip with my kids um, on Saturdays, not every Saturday, but when we can. Um, we go to grandma's house. We spend some time there. Um, we go fishing. We do some outdoor activities. We go camping. We get outside. Um, we let the kids wrestle with boredom. I hear it too. I've got a seven-year-old especially. She likes stimulation. And so... She's on board. She's the on board. She's kind of stopped saying that because she knows what the response is going to be, which is that I'm not going to entertain you. Find something fun to do. Um, unless she's asking me directly to play with her. And we'll get to that in a minute. Um, the other thing is, if they're going to be on electronics, especially our younger ones, if we really have a chance here. We try to get them to focus on imagination or things that educate the mind. I want to just promote this Duolingo for a minute. Duolingo is an app. It's free. You can pay for additional services, but it is a language learning app. Um, my daughter is Colombian, is adopted from Colombia. Um, we visited Colombia once. My older son, he's 14. When we got back, they realized they really wanted to learn more Spanish. So they have been using Duolingo. It takes some Spanish at their middle school, but, you know, my mother was a Spanish teacher, so I'm not dogging Spanish teachers, but there's only so much they can gain in middle school Spanish classes. Duolingo is awesome because it assesses where a kid is, starts them at the beginning, but my kids are speaking full sentences, and we just met a family um, at the end of last week, and my son just, hola, como estas? Uh, mucho gusto. Uh, me amo. Brooks. And uh, my daughter was speaking Spanish and this family was totally impressed. They didn't speak hardly any English. Um, the dad just spoke a little bit and the mom and the son didn't speak any. And my children using Duolingo almost exclusively 
and having the experience in, in Colombia, the visit we had there for a couple of weeks, but um, we're speaking Spanish. And I, my son would say it's almost exclusively from his Duolingo. He told me he's on a streak on his Duolingo side of, I want to say, 85 days or something like that. Um, and so, and he's speaking Spanish actually kind of well. Uh, so it's pretty cool. Duolingo, that's a great site. Um, the other thing is just be monitoring and tell parents, just kind of maybe keep an eye on what your kids are looking at. Um, okay. How does your family engage in play? And why is play important? Imagination, creativity, there's emotional benefits, promotes literacy, promotes physical fitness. So we're talking about, this is play outside of gaming. This is where we are engaging with things in our neighborhood, things in our living room, um, things in our backyard um, that are engaging um, and building connection. Here are some ideas for habits of play. Accepting a child's invitation. I have to say, I'm not a huge fan of Uno. It's because I'm totally burnt out on Uno, but my daughter loves it. And so that is the game she invites me to play with her. And I try not to show my disdain for it when she says, well, you wanna play Uno with me? And I'm just like, sure, honey. Um, but when a child engages and is inviting, as parents, we need to tell parents, say yes. Turn off the phone, get away from things, and engage. They're trying to connect. Now, again, this was coming from early. He had some, he said even 30 minutes, if you're gone at work, 30 minutes of intentional time of playing with your kid when you're home is hugely beneficial, but it's concentrating. Phone is out of the way. Um, if a, mo a mother or a parent who is a stay-at-home mom or dad, you know, you're around them anyway already, but, you know, if you want to mix in 10 to 30 minutes of that engaged, focused play activity, um, again, the idea is you're already spending a lot of time with them, but really sort of deciding to put away the, um, the other things that you're doing, the laundry, all that stuff to say, okay, it's time to engage in play. We want to have a habit of play. No devices. This is where we try to make them comfortable with the struggle against boredom. Reading books to children is a wonderful way to bond and play together. Um, Chronicles of Narnia, my wife and daughter, when she was 11, she's not 11. Actually, she's still 11 for a couple more months. But um, they read the entire Harry Potter series together. That's a lot of reading um, if you've read those books. Um, but that was one way that they connected. And it was beautiful as they read. My wife was reading and doing the different you know, voices for the different characters. Um, reading books together. We just don't read books together anymore. It's really beneficial. Um, so I know I'm going kind of fast, but I'm just trying to make sure we have a little time to, to talk at the end. But um, so then the question, what does conversation sound like in your home? This is the learned art of friendship. I don't think we're having enough conversations. Like I said, it was kind of sad to me that so many teenagers were coming to, and telling me they didn't know how to talk to people anymore. It told me that there was not a lot of conversations happening in the homes. The fact that they were coming out of COVID, coming back to their schools and didn't know how to do it. You know, some of these kids actually were pretty well versed. These were not kids who had, you know, around the spectrum. These were kids who were pretty well adjusted going into COVID and came out of COVID not knowing how to have conversations. Again, it speaks to what was, what was going on at the house at the time. There was not a lot of conversing happening. We need to be promoting conversations at home, finding rhythms and one-to-one -one conversations. The art of friendship requires practice, conversation. We befriend each other in the home to train children to go out and befriend the world. So how do we have conversations? We need to pursue one-on-one -on -one moments. So, you know, <laughs> For a while there, my wife and, and I, we put the, the girls to bed and my son's a little older, so he got to stay up a little longer. And we started watching the old Wonder Years, not the new one, but the, the old one. The Wonder Years, if you remember, those of you who watched it, covered a lot of junior high issues uh, in very real ways. Um, so it was kind of cool. We'd watch an episode, we'd turn it off, and then we'd discuss a little bit. 
kind of the, the episode with our son before he'd go to bed. Um, again, kind of fostered a one-to-one moment. Um, I remember when I was young, my dad and I would go for jogs together. By the way, shoulder to shoulder is the best way to connect boys. I read in a book um, because, you know, the eye to eye thing can be a little uncomfortable for boys, but playing together is probably the best way, especially for boys to connect. Um, talk about feelings, football, raking leaves together. I remember raking leaves, my dad, we listen to Husker football usually when we rake leaves in the fall um, on Saturdays, but um, these are kinds of things that can foster opportunities to talk daddy, daughter, date nights, mother, son, date nights. Um, these special outings. Um, you know, again, if you can get families to do daddy, daddy, daughter date nights, think about the impact. Your daughter is being treated like a queen, like a princess. She's being cared for in a loving way on this outing with dad. Now she's with a boy. Fast forward. She's 18, 17, 16 on a date with a boy. That boy, in my opinion, now I have three daughters. That boy darn well better treat her the way I treated her. And she's going to see the difference. If she's treated badly, if he's not being kind and not treating her like a princess, she's going to know the difference. But only if she'd been taught the way that she should be treated. And um, I want my daughters to have a very high expectation for how to be treated. Um, And again, us daddies are the ones that can teach them that. Um, Conversation is a tremendous way to heal trauma. Many of you know this, this idea of safety, where you can, um, a child can talk in a safe way um, and repair some of the trauma that might have occurred. So it's very important that our kids have those opportunities to process, you know, that can happen at the home. It doesn't have to happen always with the therapist, although of course that can be beneficial too. Um, The other thing is parents, and therapists, we can model vulnerability. We can model honesty. Um, and then our children hopefully can learn that it's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to talk about our feelings. Um, and when we seek them out, they will know it and they will be willing, hopefully, to, to talk with us. Okay, in the last area of the six that we're talking about today, Bedtime. What does bedtime look at you like at your house? That's our assessment question. It's the moment at the end of the day to express love and grace. Grace defined as basically undeserved kindness. <laughs> because sometimes our kids and the kids of the families we work with have really given our parents a really rough run between four o'clock and nine o'clock. It may have been five hours of hell. And this is really hard, but the idea here is we have a last shot at bedtime to offer love and grace, which is so critical, I think, for our kids to see that. Um, Letting go of the frustrations, modeling restoration of the relationship. Now, if we model restoration in relationship, what does that do again? for other relationships that our our teenagers and kids are in, you know, future relationships. You know, a lot of relationships end and marriages, I think, because there's no opportunity for restoration. It's like, you've wronged me, therefore we're done. And I know sometimes that can happen over, you know, a period of time to the point where people are like, I can't tolerate this anymore. But if we're modeling restoration of relationships, That is something, and our parents are modeling that, um, that is something that will have a huge dividends to their future relationships. Again, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but this is some language, hopefully, that you can can use. Um, Ideas for forming the habit of reconnection and extending grace. Parents should do a personal emotional inventory to identify lingering frustrations. This is important. As the kids may be putting their jams on, brushing their teeth, heading to their rooms. Parents need to kind of take the minute to go, okay, where am I at? How am I doing? Maybe this is when we do a body scan. (laughs) Maybe this is when we do a prayer so that we can prepare to go into this this restoration moment or effort. Um, Grounding, de-escalation. Decide to either move on 
or briefly seek closure. So create a habit the child looks forward to. Now this is easier with our younger client, with the younger kids, teenagers, even my own 14 year olds kind of like, I'm going to bed and off he goes. And I try like we do the, uh, the conversations, um, but he kind of does his bedtime on his own now, but especially for our younger kids, storytelling, book reading, <laughs> I put teaching diagnostics. My daughter Maho is very interested in psychology. So she likes to learn about different kinds of uh, diagnoses. And so she would blow your socks off with her knowledge of like different types of diagnoses and ADHD and autism. So it's kind of fun, but it's kind of our habit. I used to do stories of my childhood with her. She loved hearing me and all my craziness and mistakes. And, um, and then we went to diagnostics when she learned more about, she got her, she has a no, little notepad in her bed that she kind of takes notes as we're talking. Um, if a child triggers your anger, which by the way, definitely has happened to me before. There's, you know, when a kid is not par participating in the bedtime process, as we hope or expect, you might need a minute. So we need to step out, deescalate, calm the body down. Once we're composed, we come back and try again. Um, but we need to model grace in that. So questions will say, how our parents will say, how do I do this? There's, you know, we talked about six um, habits of the household. The thing is, I don't expect any family, even yours, to sort of tackle all six of these at once. So I just say, begin wherever you are, wherever the family is. And pick some area specifically where a habit, a new habit can be formed and can begin. And that's really um, all that can be expected early on. But we strive for those small accomplishments. And those of you who work with depression treatment understand what small accomplishments are. You know, you can't try to do it all at once. You know, for a depressed person, getting out of bed and making it to some breakfast in the morning is a huge accomplishment depending on the severity of the depression, but, and we're just going to be working on small accomplishments. And that's how it is with families sometimes. Cause if you're pulling your hair out, I get it. I actually get it. I've got a kid coming in 11 whose family pulling their hair out right now. And so I'm trying to help the mom and pull her in one-on-one -on -one and they say, we work, we got to focus on small accomplishments right now. I know it's frustrating and difficult, but you know, she waited 16 years to start this. It's already pretty far along. It's already pretty difficult. And so we're having to focus on small accomplishments right now and kind of work our way forward. Um, but my open desire uh, is that you can teach at least some of these meaning-making opportunities. You can promote harmony and growth in your family, your own personal families, but also to the families that you're working with. You know, again, I think it's important that we get our own families in order the best of our abilities before we go out there and try to serve other families. It's very important. And I know many of you are doing a wonderful job with this, but many of you are struggling with that. Maybe some of this is really, you know, steam things that you need to implement in on your own, um, leaving this meeting today. And um, so that you can be practicing it, trying it on for size, see how it goes, and then come back to the families you're working with and say, I'm gonna, I want you to try something because you will then have that experience with it and will um, have that that opportunity to share um, with these families. But um, uh, so that is my hope for you. Now, um, I'm going to take a couple of questions here, but I'm not going to have time for all of these questions. So what I want to suggest to you is that I'm hopeful that some of the things that have come up today as, relate, as it relates to your own self-care as providers um, and your agency or the team that you're working with. I've, I hope some things have been kind of percolating so that you can then come back and talk about them in the next meeting that you have. Um, so on one hand, I'm, I'm willing to answer some questions here, but I would love for you as teams to come back together and say, okay, let's talk about how, how we're doing this. Let's talk about maybe some way that we as a team can be integrating this into our work with families. Um, so I kind of want, this to be, I mean, I know it's, you know, I, I don't know, some trainings that I go to, you know, you, you finish the training, you say, okay, I've got my CPUs, cool. And you're off to the next thing and you just never basically, you know, 
turn and never look it back at that training again. I hope that this has brought some ideas to your mind of how self-care works for you, how self-care and um, focus on serving each other and humility and um, building resiliency within your team can be fostered, but also then how you can um, approach our families. So um, I'm going to look here to see what questions we might have. Dr. Bassard. Uh, yeah. Hi, at this time, we don't have any questions. We okay. just had a, um, a request for the list of books that were mentioned. If you could send those to me, I could forward those on. Say it again, what, which one? A list of books that you mentioned during, oh, your, okay. during your training. Okay, sure, I can do that. Um, uh, sure, I can send that. Um, I do have some good sources on that, but um, cool. Well, if there's no questions, then I really appreciate all of you who signed up for this today and signed in. And I wish the best of luck to all of you. And hopefully um, you can continue to serve our community and serve our families well. So thank you. Thank you very much.